Good afternoon and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Sally Whipple. I'm the Executive Director here at Connecticut's Old State House and we are very happy to have you here today. Um, this program is funded along with the rest of our lunchtime series by the Connecticut Humanities Council, or Connecticut Humanities, and they are also doing um, a project this year called Connecticut at Work. So we were trying to think of what we could do that would be different for Connecticut at Work and we thought of Connecticut Animals at Work. This is a subject near and dear to my heart because I love animals and I own the laziest dog on earth. Um, his name is Buddy, he weighs about 70 pounds, he's a collie, and he barks until my husband comes to carry him up the stairs and then at the top of the stairs expects a treat. So I don't know if this says more about my husband or about Buddy, but Buddy is super lazy. Um, but we are not lazy. We like to do a lot of programs. We like to keep people entertained. And I want to remind you that on your seats you have a couple of rack cards. One is for our noontime lectures, which are free and open to the public. Le next month on August 20th, we have state archaeologist retired Nick Bellantoni coming to see us. And in September, we have a program on the history of bicycles and what's going on with, in bi with bicycles in Hartford and Connecticut today. Then we have our farmer's market every Tuesday and Friday. And on many Fridays, we have concerts outside, which are really wonderful. So if you want to come and sit and buy vegetables and listen to music, it's perfect. Um, but for today, we are very happy to be presenting Connecticut Animals at Work. We have some wonderful guests with us, and hosting the program today, as usual, be, will be Diane Smith, who is the Senior Producer for Program Development at Conne the Connecticut Network. And I'd like you to join me in welcoming Diane to the program today. What Sally didn't mention is that she actually has two collies, and they are both rescues, and they were named when she got them, okay? So I kid you not, her two collies are named Buddy and Holly. <laughs> so for any of you old rock and roll fans, you know what I'm talking about. Um, there are uh, 164 million pets in the United States. That is triple the number we had in only the 1970s. It means that 62% of American households have at least one pet. And that adds up. Last year, we spent $50 billion on our animal companions. Many of us treat these animals as though they are our children, our family members. But there are many animals in our society who do much more than just keep us company. They're working animals, and they perform serious tasks every day. Some guide the blind or aid people with other disabilities. Some sniff for bombs or chase criminals. And we're even recently learning about dogs who can sniff out cancer in humans. We're going to hear about some of them and meet some of them in a little while. But first, we're going to do what we generally do in this program, is look back in history a little bit. Animals have been working for us here in New England for a long time. In the early days of our settlements, farmers depended on the heavy labor of draft animals, whether it was to pull a plow through a field or pull a stone out of our rocky soil. In some cases, they may have been horses, but more likely in the 19th century, these farm workers were oxen. And joining us now to talk more about that and about the agrarian life with animals is Reese Simmons, the coordinator of agriculture at Old Sturbridge Village. Please welcome Reese. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Reese Simmons. I'm the coordinator of agriculture at Old Sturbridge Village. I want to thank the Old State House for having me as well. I want to start by just going over a little bit of history about the village and a little bit about our mission. Uh, first, we view ourselves as a learning resource for all of New England. Um, so even though we're located in central Massachusetts, uh, we really try to encompass the entire story of New England, including um, all, all, all six uh, New England states and, of course, New York as well. Um, so let's start with a little bit about the farm. Um, the Freeman Farm is where we base our educational uh, opportunities in and around our agriculture program. The Freeman Farm is meant to basically, I basically sum up what an average farm in New England is all about. Now, the typical size of a New England farm in our time period was about 100 acres. Uh, so that's what we use as an average. And how the land is divided to support these animals. Uh, that, that we're keeping is about 50% of the land 
was, well, 100% of the land, excuse me, uh, was divided into thirds, essentially. A third of the land was divided into pasture for these animals. A third of the land was divided between your tillage, which means your turned ground, uh, the area in which you're planting your corn, planting your oats, planting your rye. And a third of your land is basically devoted into your woodlots. And here are some of the breakdowns of the different towns in which uh, land was divided. No story is exactly the same, right? And it's hard for us to really show what all of New England looked like, because in every area of New England, it's a little bit different. So what we try to do is we work on averages. And these averages is what we generally break down into the, that, that thirds. Now, now to our animals. Uh, the animals uh, on our farm, there are, there are basic cornerstone animals on pretty much every New England farm. They were cows, oxen, chickens, sheep, and pigs. Those were pretty much on almost every farm in New England. Along with horses, horses were on about 50% of farms. Um, so those are your basic animals on your farm. And in, in Sturbridge, the average was about 15 head of cattle, about two horses, and about 15 sheep, as well as maybe a couple pigs, and who knows how many chickens, because they, they really didn't keep you know, close, accurate records of chickens, because chickens were just birds. Uh, and they were just there to provide you with as much fresh eggs as possible. All right, so at the village, what we like to do is we like to use these things as teaching tools. So all of the things that are in and around the village, our costumes, our farms, our animals, are all teaching tools for us to display what farming and what life was like in the 1830s, and then how it relates to us today. We have a lot of service dogs here today, um, and the service animal industry is not much different than it was in the, in the 1830s. All of these animals serve a purpose. And that's one of the things I like to break down with our visitors that come into the village, is that everything has a role. Everything has a role. And I oftentimes ask the people that, that come to us, who here has dogs and cats at home? And half the kids always raise their hand, right? And I say, what's their role? And they say, oh, I don't know, blah, 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 to eat, to, you know, to, I have to walk the dog. Um, and I say, well, no, it, it, it's your friend, right? And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's my friend. And these animals are companion animals, right? And in our time period, you had a lot of animals to be companion animals, right? And you develop these special bonds with these animals, and especially the animals that you're up close to which I'm gonna talk a little bit about my oxen, but your cows too, right? I mean, you're sitting underneath that cow eight months out of the year, milking it twice a day. It's not like you're not gonna develop a, a strong bond with that cow too. Uh, so there's a lot of animals that, 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 that you rely upon. Your horse, of course. If, if you have a horse, um, you're obviously bonding, you know, you're developing a strong relationship with that horse. And the people that come to the village are looking for that because a lot of people have this strong connection with animals, right? And that strong connection with animals, when we bring these large animals out, you know, behind, out from, you know, they're fenced in most of the time. But when I put a yoke on them and I lead them out, or we put them in stanchions, we let the people come back into the stanchions and see the milking, you know, they're right up close to them. And they see these 2,000 pound animals and they see that nothing's holding them. I'm not holding any reins. They just have a yoke on, and I'm holding a little lash. That's about it. And then they, 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 they see the kind of power that, that, that these animals have. All right, so we run two different farms. So we run the Freeman Farm, which is a traditional farm, but then we also run the town farm. Uh, the town farm is more of a progressive farm. Uh, so we show a little bit more of the progressive uh, agriculture um, in and around the town farm. And one of the big things in and around the animals is the improved breeds. Um, so selective breeding basically started in the 1700s in England, and this selective breeding uh, led to what in our time period was the ideal cow, the Holstein of the 1830s, uh, which was the Durham or the Shorthorn. And the, here, here's a picture of the improved Durham bull. And as you can see, this bull here, um, it was bred for beef. You, you see how wide his shoulders are, how boxy shaped it is. You know, it was bred to gain weight as quickly as possible. 
because what we have at the village, now this is a, a particular breed, but what we interpret at the village is mixed blood animals, or natives as they called them in our, in our time period. Because people didn't really, people didn't have the means in which to really focus in on one specific breed. What they wanted was an all around animal that was good in all different areas, not necessarily really specific. Like today, for instance, agriculture is very, very specific because certain animals are really good at certain things. You know, if you were raised on a farm and you raised Holstein, I could be 99% sure that you're on a dairy farm. Just like if you were on a farm and you raised Angus, I could be 99% sure that you were on a beef farm. Um, so, uh, one of the things there, uh, here's a picture of a, of a short horn now. This is actually a milking short horn, uh, Priscilla. Uh, and her calf, Posey. Uh, she was from a few years ago. Uh, what we try to do at the farm, now getting, getting back into um, the cattle and the oxen, what we try to do is we try to have between one and three calves every year, because that's what the average was. And that gives us the milking cow for our demonstrations, and it gives us a pool of young calves that we might be able to then train into uh, a team of oxen. So here's Posey, a little heifer, so a little girl calf here. We always try to calve um, around April. That, that was the ideal time to calve because if you're calving early April, late March, sometimes into May, depending upon if you, if you get it right, um, what you're doing is you're allowing that calf to nurse off the mother, develop a lot of the strength from the milk because they, they're on milk for the first three months. Then by the time that that, that they're off the milk after three months. You're into July and August, and you're into the peak of your uh, pasturing season. So, 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 so it's the best both for your farm, your dairying requirements, and the animal itself. Now, the dairy is, of course, the, the crux of the farm. It's the, it's the most important part of, of our farming operation because it gives the farmer the most tradable commodity. And the, those two things are butter and cheese. Um, we milk twice a day. Historically, that was true as well. They milked roughly 12 hours apart. We don't do it quite 12 hours apart because I don't think anybody wants to come to the village at 6 a.m. in the morning or stay until 6 o'clock in the afternoon. So we do a little bit of a bridged schedule. Um, so we milk in every morning at 10 o'clock, we milk one of our cows, then we milk another cow at 3 o'clock. So therefore, we can use this uh, teaching opportunity to hit the widest range audience as possible. And we have allowed people back. This is exactly the view that people get uh, when they come into our farm. And there's a milkmaid there sitting, uh, milking, answering, and talking about the cow and any kind of uh, questions that, that they might have. Now, draft animals weren't just oxen in our time period. Like I said, about half the families, roughly, had horses. Now, generally, those horses weren't the large draft horses that we might think of today, like the Belgians or the Percherons, or the Clydesdales. They were more like a Morgan horse, if you will. So a smaller horse, a riding horse. But if you had one of those horses, you definitely wouldn't just be riding it, you'd be working it as well. So whether you'd be out there with a single shallow plow, or you would be out there harrowing out a field, or you would be you know, using it to travel, like, like this picture, um, you'd be using that, that animal as well. But oxen really did shape the New England ag it shaped the New England uh, landscape. Oxen were the draft animal of preference for New England farmers. Uh, there's a strong, strong connection between New England farmers and oxen. Oxen held on here in New England a lot longer than it did in all other places. Even, old in, even over in Old England, by about the mid-1700s, pretty much oxen had been phased out you know, due to, due, due to the uh, advantages horses can give you. But here in New England, uh, because of the small plot sizes, because of the rocky soil, because of maybe the frugal nature of New England farmers, you know, old Yankees are known to be frugal, right? You know, those things led people to hold on to their oxen a little bit longer. Now I'll go over a few of the jobs that, that, that the oxen were really good at, plowing. Plowing is probably the most prototypical job that a farmer does in New England with their oxen. The old, the old term, the old farming measurement, acre, 
Um, acre is actually an old English term of what an oxen can plow in one day. That's why it's kind of an arbitrary number. That's still used today. There's tons of things that have agricultural roots that would just get into our modern day, you know, everyday usage that we just don't, that we just don't think about. But after you get done plowing, more often than not, you have to harrow. Um, now, harrowing is a basically raking out a large field. This is really good for young oxen, for training oxen. I really like to harrow with training oxen because what it does, it allows you to get out into a field, an enclosed area, drag a little bit of weight because they like to work. And it allows them to kind of learn the patterns. Because when you're harrowing, you're essentially going in concentric circles. And it allows you, it allows the animal and the driver, if the driver is new too, this is another thing that I like to do with new drivers, is get them out there and, and start harrowing fields. Because it allows the driver and the animals to develop that relationship. Cart work, of course, is really, really important. This time of year, cart work is really important with what the, these gentlemen are doing in this picture, which is bringing in hay. My most important crop each and every year is the hay I bring in for my animals. The animals are the lifeblood of the farm, and to be able to feed those animals year round is crucial. And it allows you to, you know, allows you to really think about how many animals you can keep. Um, so an average head of cattle, right, was eating roughly between three and four acres of hay a year. So, so if you had 10 head of cattle for average, you'd need to bring in somewhere between 30 and 40 acres of hay cut. So you know, every, every year you had to bring in lots and lots of hay. And then of course there's other, there's other work that oxen do. Uh, the two pictures here, uh, one is of a gentleman working with an oxen with, an, with uh, a stone boat. Uh, what do they say the best crop here in New England is every single year? The stones that come out of the field. Uh, that's a reason why um, you know, at the village, one of the hardest things for us to showcase is the landscape, right? Um, because everybody is used to trees. You know, it, I don't, if you grew up in the 20s, you're used to trees. If you grew up today, you're used to trees. You know, trees have just been everywhere in New England uh, for the last 150 years or so. Uh, but in the 1830s, it was wide open. And that's a reason why nowadays when we're driving on, you know, backcountry roads, you see stone walls everywhere you know, in the middle of the woods, because those are all once open fields. Those were once, you know, sheep pastures. Those were once hay pastures. Um, those were once, you know, cattle yards. Um, all of those um, walls, walls had a purpose. Um, and moving stones was definitely a job that um, people relied heavily upon their oxen to do. And the other work there um, is uh, moving a sled with some wood. Um, of course, your wood lots were an incredibly valuable piece of property. Um, you know, an average family was burning somewhere between about 10 and 12 cords of wood a year, plus all the other things that you needed wood for, like your fence material, your building materials, um, and I could go on. All right, so back to the oxen specifically. Um, so we use the oxen at the village as a big teaching tool. Um, so we like to bring the animals out from, from behind those fences where there's a barrier out into where the people are. And here are two of our junior interns. Uh, so we like to have our junior intern program, our camp programs to get really up close with the animals. Try to get them as much working relationship with those animals as possible. Here's, here, here's, here's a couple staff members bringing around the oxen uh, on a parade. Uh, so, 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 so we do that on the 4th of July. Now here's a team of oxen that I learned with. And this is the whole reason why I'm still at the village today. Was the, the when I learned how to drive this team, Ed and Henry, um, there was something that kind of uh, made me realize what I wanted to do. And it's, it's the reaction I got from the crowd when they came up to see me with the oxen. Because it was that kind of uh, relationship with the animals that I was able to develop with these guys. These guys were so easy. They were a nine-year-old team when I started driving them. They basically taught me how to drive oxen. Um, and I was able to bring them out. They did everything so easily. They tested me. Every, every time you know, a team of oxen will test you. Um, but they ended up being a great team for me. 
The first team that I trained was Lance and Henry. These guys are a team of Devons. This is the, probably the most prototypical looking cattle for our time period. This kind of reddish brown, uh, long horns, um, medium builds, about 1,500 pounds at maturity, roughly. They might be a little overweight uh, at the village, but that's okay. They, like I said, at the village, they're, they're a teaching tool. They're not, they're not going to win any pulls up at Freiburg. Um, but uh, I can bring them out into a crowd of a, of a couple hundred and be, and be perfectly safe with them. Uh, so this is me uh, with Lance and Henry. They were probably about a year and a half there. We got these guys at a year old. Um, they were born up in Maine. Now, not all teams work, too. You know, not all animals work for their particular job. This is a team, they were a wonderful team. Jesse and James, you know, go to, to go back to the, the, the funny names. Je, je, these guys were Jesse and James. We got them full grown. And they were a great team. They won polls. They were trained by a 4-H team. Uh, they were a wonderful team. But they just weren't used to our museum environment. So as much as they could pull all day, they could pull a lot of weight, they just weren't as safe as we needed them to be at the museum environment. So this is a, a good example of not all animals are fits in all places. And you really have to find your animals that really work in your space. So this is a team that we're working now. This is uh, Doc in blue. These guys are a team of Randall linebacks. And right now they're four years old. Uh, and this is the, full, the, 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 the team that we're working with today. And thank you so much for having me. We always like to start with a little bit of history on uh, uh, that was Reese's part. Um, but as you know, um, we have animals working with us every day here. And uh, one thing I want to mention besides the animals you're going to meet today is that at the end of this program, you can go outside and the Hartford Mounted Police are going to be there so that you can ask them questions and uh, talk to them about their horses. And we couldn't invite them in. It was a little too much. So, um, but they are going to be there for you to meet and to talk to. Uh, this is also the section of the program, which we're taping for CTN, by the way, uh, where you're part of the conversation. So it, you can raise your hand if you have a question, and we'll have somebody get to you with a microphone. So if you can wait to speak until the microphone gets close to you, that would be great, because that's a better way to record it for television. So let me introduce the rest of our panel. Um, joining me now is Jennifer Adams and her dog, Gizmo. And Jennifer is a special education teacher, and Gizmo is a therapy dog with a, uh, a organization called Paws for Friendship Incorporated. And Gizmo happens to be the only dog that I personally have met who has his own Facebook page. <laughs> and how many friends does he have on his Facebook page? I think he's over 25,000 right now. Yay. <laughs> and you've met Reese already. Uh, our next guest is uh, Julie Unwin. Julie is the Chief Operating Officer of the Fidelco Guide Dog Foundation, which is located in Bloomfield, Connecticut, and Fidelco has grown into one of the leading providers internationally of guide dogs. Julie began her association with Fidelco as a volunteer puppy raiser, which is an opportunity for many of you if you're interested. Uh, she has raised two guide dogs, two breed dogs, and one career change working dog, and I'll ask you in a minute what that is. She's currently raising her sixth pup, Igor, and this is Tonka, who is with her. And by the way, Julie has brought some really delightful children's books, and we'll have those for sale in the shop right across the hallway uh, after this program is over. And finally, not last but not least, is Michael Wynn. Michael is from MSA Security. It's a company that trains bomb-sniffing dogs. They're based in Windsor. I didn't know anything about them until I happened to see you on network television and said, whoa, I didn't know that. Um, Mr. Wynn is accompanied by Soleil. She is a three-year-old German Shepherd. And Mr. Wynn is a retired Connecticut State Trooper. So if he looks familiar, maybe it's because he had a little encounter with you at one time. <laughs> As a trooper, he was a master trainer for the Connecticut State Police Canine Program. And recently, he's been appointed to the Department of Homeland Security's advisory panel, which is drafting a set of national standards for bomb dog training. So Jennifer, let me start with you and ask you, um, how does a little dog like Gizmo get to have 25,000 friends on Facebook? I'm not sure. <laughs> we started out as a little fan page on Facebook. It was started by a friend of ours in Pennsylvania, actually. And um, the more people that came said, you should make the little group a page and just sort of spread from there. 
Tell us a little bit about what Gizmo does as a therapy dog and what it takes to be a therapy dog. Well, um, there's training classes that you could take that are geared toward um, therapy. Some of them are specific um, to the age group or population where, that you'd want your dog to work with. He's I'm a sure. little tired, you may notice. He's Don't mind him. Or bored. <laughs> Yeah, um, and then what they need to do is pass a therapy evaluation. Mm -hmm. And once that's done, um, there's all sorts of groups out there that you know that you can research and, and find a group that matches your philosophy and mm -hmm. fits your needs. And, and then once you um, join the group, you can ha you're insured under their policy mm -hmm. and you're able to go to, to different facilities. Mm -hmm. So Gizmo works at Hartford Public Library as their pause to read dog. Yeah. And uh, he also works at um, ECHN hospitals, and he works at a school for in Manchester School District here All in right. Connecticut. Well, and we'll get into his uh, background a little bit more in a minute, but okay. I want to uh, bring Julie in now. Uh, Julie, I have been a big fan of Fidelco's for a long time. I've been in Connecticut for more than 25 years, and I think one of the first things I explored was Fidelco because of its wonderful wonderful founder. Tell us a little bit about how Fidelco got started. Yes, Tonka wants to add some conversation to this too. Um, Fidelco got started by Roby and Charlie Command. Some mm -hmm. people here may know of Command Aircraft. And they started Fidelco approximately 50 years ago, mm -hmm. and they started as a breeding organization. And when Fidelco first started, we bred the German Shepherd dog to give to other guide dog schools and to law enforcement to help them. Mm -hmm. And then along the line, Roby and Charlie decided that training the guide dogs would also be a good thing. So mm -hmm. now Fidelco does do all the breeding training and placement. Mm -hmm. And Julie, my understanding is that Fidelco's training is a little bit different than the way other uh, guide dog agencies conduct their training. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, well, Fidelco pioneered in-community training. Mm -hmm. So what's different about that is the Fidelco trainers bring the dog to the client that is blind. So in other guide dog schools, if you were blind, you would have to travel to the school and stay there for up to a month. Mm -hmm. Where Fidelco comes to you and stays in your neighborhood, goes to your workplace, wherever you worship, things of that nature. So if the dog runs into a situation it may not have experienced before, the trainer is right there with you to help you along the way. It's interesting that you mentioned places where you worship because I did a story at one point about a... Um, a minister at, uh, who was also a professor at the Divinity School at Yale. And she had a church that she was the pastor of, and she would, her dog would take her to church every Sunday, and she said, I always know when it's time to end the sermon because he licks the back of my leg, and that means <laughs> enough already. Because <laughs> he would go right up in his old, beautiful old-fashioned church, and he would go right up in the pulpit with her, so he's really wonderful. And we'll get back to that a little bit more. Um, Michael, I was very interested to hear that uh, this security company is um, training its dogs in Windsor. Tell us a little bit about the company and about the type of facility that you have. Uh, MSA Security is an employee-owned company. Uh, it's been in existence uh, since the late 80s. It was originally founded by a New York City detective, and it was a very small company that uh, trained just uh, trained and handled and uh, worked with narcotics detection dogs. And because of the terrorist acts that occurred in 1993, and then the latest one in 2001, uh, the company has blossomed and grown uh, to a size of about 600 employees, and we currently have 200 dog teams. Mm. You were um, a master trainer for the uh, Connecticut uh, State Police before you retired. Tell us how what you do today with MSA might be different than the type of training that you did when you were training for the troopers. Uh, the, the training is, is, is not so much different. It, we just have a different mission. Um, having uh, dogs that are uh, provided for private industry as well as um, government properties, uh, that's our main focus and our main goal. Uh, we also um, have a small contingent that deploys overseas. So the, the job is about the same, or the training is about the same, but our just mission is a little bit different than, than what we would do for the State Police Department. Julie, tell us a little bit about uh, Fidelco's German Shepherds that they raise, because they are a little bit different than your average run-of-the-mill German Shepherd that you might buy at another breeder or what have you. Yes, we breed all our own German Shepherds, and we call it a breed within a breed. Sort of how you were speaking before about the oxen, it's very similar to the Fidelco German Shepherd. You will notice that they are not 
like the American German Shepherd. Their backs are much straighter. Mm -hmm. And they are bred for their stamina, their temperament, and their willingness to work. Mm -hmm. When you're a guide dog, when you're in harness, you're always at work. Mm -hmm. So the minute the person is ready to get going, the dog always has to be ready. Mm -hmm. So it's a little different than some of the other careers. The other thing that's really different about the German Shepherd guide dog is they are taught intelligent disobedience. Oh, explain that. That's a very interesting concept, I think. So if I'm getting, if I'm blind and I have my guide dog and I'm getting ready to cross the street and I tell my dog forward, the dog will not go until it's safe for me to cross the street. So if there's a car that's rolling to a stop, the dog won't go until the car comes to a complete stop. So the dog actually has to disobey my command until it's safe for me to cross. Interesting. How long does it take the um, person who is getting the guide dog to be able to respect that and feel safe? Well, that's the most important thing about getting a guide dog. And we have, I think you also have a copy of our book, Trust mm -hmm. the Dog. Mm -hmm. It's very important for the client to learn how to trust the dog. Mm -hmm. Training with the dog with the client takes approximately two to three weeks. Mm -hmm. It all depends on if they had another dog before. But we go back every year to make sure the client is safe with the dog. And anytime the client needs more instruction, we'll always travel back to their home. I don't know whether one of your trainers um, taught this to a dog, but one of the uh, people that I met who has a Fidelco dog travels a lot uh, for business. And the dog actually goes up to the carousel in the airport and pulls the luggage off the carousel. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they learn things on their own, too. <laughs> Reese, in the period of history that you're uh, recreating at Old Sturbridge Village, did people actually have companion animals, or was that considered frivolous? Or well, yeah, I mean, we we oftentimes say you know dogs and cats were certainly around in our time period, um, but you didn't have those dogs and cats necessarily for companion. They served a purpose, a lot like a lot like these dogs are serving. Uh, they were generally there for rodent control, mm -hmm. uh, or you had cats for rodent control. Um, you had you had enough animals. Animals, you know, as companions, and you, and uh, the family sizes were, of course, a little bit larger. So you had enough companions where I don't think, or at least our research doesn't indicate uh, that people had dogs and cats uh, strictly for companionships. Um, you know, you had if you wanted to. Uh, get close to an animal, you went out and milked a cow. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I never had thought about the relationship that you have when yeah. you're milking a cow twice yeah. a day until you mentioned it. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about Gizmo. What kind of a dog is Gizmo? Gizmo's, Besides adorable. Gizmo's pretty. He's adorable. Uh, he, is, he is called a Miki, which actually is not a recognized breed. Mm -hmm. It stems from um, Maltese, Papillon, and Japanese Chin, for sure. And then there's another school of thought that says there might be a couple other breeds in there. Mm -hmm. What can he actually do for if, uh, when you take him to the places that you go, the Hartford Public Library and some of the other places, what does he actually do there? I think um, he does different tasks at each place. At, at Hartford Public Library, I think he's a non-judgmental listener mm -hmm. to young readers or reticent learners and readers that maybe are a little uncomfortable reading to an adult who might jump in and correct them. Um, and Gizmo just lays right on their lap and listens to them and appreciates anything that's read to him. So um, I think that's what he does there. He and must be very well read by now. He, he does a lot of good stories. <laughs> He'll tell you some after the show. <laughs> and how about when he goes into a hospital setting? You mentioned uh, the uh, Eastern Connecticut Hospital. Actually, a respiratory therapist from there um, just posted on his Facebook page that she re recalled a time when um, a woman was having some respiratory issues. They called Gizmo in, and we, we sat him on her lap. And she was able to calm herself down and begin to breathe normally again without any medication. So, he does, he does fit. Um, like Michael, um, tell us a little bit about how these dogs work, uh, what they are actually doing when they are at work. Well, as you can see, she's uh, doing a fine job here, just kind of <laughs> resting in. Uh... I'm feeling pretty safe. I'm thinking there's no bombs in here. <laughs> and, and, and truly, that's what we look for in our line of work. Uh, we want the dog to be as. Um, socially and environmentally sound as possible. We want her to be relaxed when she's not in the working mode. Uh, her training takes about six to eight weeks to uh, accomplish. That's when we marry the dog up with a handler. Mm -hmm. They go through several more weeks of training and then eventually they become operational. Uh, some of the jobs that uh, we're, we're asked to do is we do just the traditional um, 
sweeping of buildings, aircraft, um, vehicles. Those are the pretty much what our mission is. We've, we've also kind of expanded into the cargo area. Um, that's become another uh, piece that the dogs are uh, able to do. They can do literally in, in a short period of time thousands of pieces of parcel. Wow. So um, these dogs are not um, looking for drugs. They're looking for ex potentially explosive devices. They're actually, all we're doing is training them on odor. And so it's explosive odor that they're imprinted on. And, um, and they, they, they're trained on a number of explosive odors. And, and that's the key. Uh, their training is ongoing. Uh, we have two different types of methodologies. One of them is play reward, which is uh, Soleil's forte. And then we also have food reward. Mm -hmm. uh, so depending on the breed and depending on the, the, uh, the drive mechanism of the dog, it depends on what they're going to um, eventually do. It's either play or, or food. Sally's dog gets the food reward even when it doesn't do anything, when it gets <laughs> carried up the stairs by resume. If anybody has any questions, by the way, please raise your hand, and um, Paul will come to you with the microphone uh, if you have a question for any of us. Right in the back there, Paul. In the back. I'm curious of the ages at which you start training these animals. I mean, for instance, I mean, I know Occident dogs are different, but they probably are similar in their developmental stage. I mean, you, you're an adolescent. You start when you're, you know, and so I'm, for all our, a therapy dog, I don't know if it's quite the same thing, but um, sort of at which point do you start to train them? It's a good question. And for, I'd like to hear from all, all of our speakers, okay. please. Michael, why don't I start with you? Are they started as puppies or? Uh, actually, uh, where we acquire our dogs are from Fidelco. Um, Soleil is a career change Fidelco dog. Uh -huh. um, she just uh, had a little bit too much energy and uh, wanted to use her nose, so that's why you know, she became an explosive detection dog. But the, actually, the dogs start when they're, when they're first whelped, and um, they begin the training process right from that point. Uh -huh. So the basic things that the dogs uh, are trained in at that age, from like 12 weeks until a year's time, are basic commands and basic obedience. They're socialized and environmentalized. Um, in our program, we look to have a dog that's about 12 months old and no older than 18 months to be able to begin the training process. Uh, we can train older dogs, but we want the longevity out of the, the dog, so that's why we start at, at 12 months. Mm -hmm. um, I've known people who have raised puppies, and I actually know a couple who have raised puppies that then go into training and then go on to be a guide dog, and then when they retire, this couple takes them back. So they have them when they're little, and they get a broken heart when they leave, and then they come back as an elderly dog with all the issues that elderly dogs have, but they've loved the dog at the beginning and the end. So what does it take to be a volunteer puppy raiser? Well, you have to be willing to accept the dog into your home at eight weeks of age mm -hmm. and keep them until they're about a year and a half of age. And to answer your question, too, our training starts, as Michael said, at birth, because we start to get the dog used to all different surfaces and different sounds right off the bat. And then they go to puppy raisers at eight weeks and you come to Fidelco for classes in Bloomfield on Saturdays mm -hmm. and you learn how to do the basic obedience and you work on them with socialization. Mm -hmm. um, today's a little bit of a special day for me because I was Soleil's puppy raiser. Oh. So <laughs> you asked about my career change dog, that would be Soleil. Oh. Um, so basically when you have a puppy in your home, you bring them to as many places as possible. We ask you to introduce them to at least 100 people in that time. Tonka, what's up? <laughs> and then they come back to Fidelco when they're approximately a year and a half mm -hmm. old, mm -hmm. and then they go through six months of intense guide dog training. And those are the dogs that you see walking around here in Hartford. At what point did you decide that um, this beautiful dog was not appropriate for a, to be a guide dog? So they got career changed um, right around her first birthday. Mm -hmm. And it was just, as Michael said, she had a lot of energy. And not every dog is meant to fit into a harness. Mm -hmm. So we try to do whatever is best for each individual mm -hmm. animal. Mm -hmm. um, they all have a, a strong willingness to work. Mm -hmm. And to talk. And to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Before the show, he was sitting up here with no problem sleeping. So he got all his sleeping done. Um, and 
we try to find them the best career possible, mm -hmm. whether it is single cent work, whether it's dual purpose with a police department, mm -hmm. because Fidelco has also provided over 500 dogs to different police departments right. Right. throughout New England. Interesting. And I understand you have some new kinds of clients now, um, different from the more typical Fidelco client from years ago, because now you're getting a lot of young veterans who've come back. Tell yes. us a little bit about that. We are definitely seeing um, the unfortunate circumstances of the war. And it's amazing to have these, um, thus far have all been gentlemen, but have these veterans come back and adjust first to being blind and then adjust to getting a guide dog. Mm -hmm. One of our most recent clients is a Paralympic gold medalist. Mm -hmm. And on the year anniversary of when he lost his sight, he stood on and received his gold medal in the Olympics. Wonderful. And just to let you know what these dogs do, he talked about that it would take him 40 minutes to get to the pool and back with his white cane. With his dog, it takes him half the amount of time. So he's able to train in the pool, and he is planning to go to the next Paralympics also. Yeah. Um, as long as I mentioned um, vet or, uh, vets coming back, uh, there are a number of vets who come back who have suffered uh, PTSD or other kinds of injuries, head injuries, other kinds of injuries, and they become really good candidates for their own therapy dog. That would actually be, um, it's kind of their own therapy dog is more like, um, they have PTSD dogs. Mm -hmm. A therapy dog really is meant to work with other people. Mm -hmm. And so Gizmo's a therapy dog. When we go places, he's there to lend support to the other people in the facility mm -hmm. that we visit. Mm -hmm. So I think like a PTSD dog or an emotional support animal, that type of thing would be more along the terms of a service dog, mm -hmm. yes? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. And if anyone has any questions, yes. I have sort of a silly question for Reese first and a more serious one for, for everyone. Uh, the silly question is this. I was at Sturbridge about a year ago. It was there about 4 o'clock in the afternoon standing outside the bank, and just then the sheep from the other side of the, of the campus come rushing over, nobody guiding them, just uh, over to the town farm. Is that where it was? Um, how did that happen? Was that in a matter of instinct? Yeah, no, that's, Were they going to them... dinner or what? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's actually one of the most uh, exciting parts of our day uh, is the, 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 the 30 seconds that the sheep go running across. Reese, you need every, to get out more. Everybody, that's the most exciting no, 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 part no, no. of your day. No, believe me, I, everybody that's around there loves it. Um, but yeah, no, so they, what they do is we, we feed them at two different locations throughout the day. So in the morning they run up and they spend the day out in pasture, and then every afternoon they, they, they run back to the townhouse. Uh, but every, anytime that there's kids around, uh, you can always see the, 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 the sheep ahead and a whole trail of kids following <laughs> uh, the, the, the sheep down. So you know, they're, they're creatures of habit and patterns, uh -huh. for sure. And you said you had a more serious question as well? And that is, um, the presumption I think many of us make is that if there's an animal, there's an owner. And I mean, looking back in the 19th century and looking now, uh, is there um, a degree of, uh, you know, animal rental ship, um, or can we presume animals are already o always owned by the people who may make use of them? Now, if you're talking about renting, you know, oxen oftentimes in our time period, because, because money was so scarce in our time period, the trade of labor was the most traded commodity. And a lot of times that labor wasn't necessarily your labor, your ch children's labor, your wife's labor. It was a lot of times your oxen's labor or your horse's labor. Um, so very often in our time period, we assume or we've uh, surmised that um, you know, just because a team of oxen was working in a field doesn't necessarily mean it's their oxen or necessarily even that it's their field. They could be renting that piece of land as well. Um, so absolutely. I want to ask you a little bit more about Gizmo, um, and that is um, what, um, what kind of quality does a dog need to have in order to be a therapy dog? Because it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a breed like this. There can be all different kinds of breeds, I think. Right. It's not really based on breed as much as temperament. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's the first and foremost. And he, he, a therapy dog clearly needs to be very well socialized. Mm -hmm. Um, not nervous in different environments, um, tolerate the loud noises of a hospital, maybe sirens or clanging, carts going by, and just not be reactive to that. Mm -hmm. Tell me a 
little bit about the group that you're associated with, Pause for Friendship. Pause for Friendship, Inc. is a worldwide organization. It's based in Tampa, Florida. And they actually certify not just dogs, but pets. It's um, animal-assisted therapy pets. Mm -hmm. And they visit all kinds of facilities, from colleges to hospitals to libraries, um, all over the world, Australia, South America, and all over the country. So, What's Tonka trying to tell us? Tonka is trying to tell us that his trainer is also in the room. Oh, okay. <laughs> so Tonka is recognizing his trainer and saying, I want to go outside and walk. I want to get busy. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, I think about um, of the amount of time that it takes um, to raise a dog and then to train a dog. And I wonder, you know, what's the cost of training one of the guide dogs? And then what do you charge to the blind person who gets that dog? It takes $45,000 $45, dog. per dog to breed, train, raise them. And that also includes the follow-ups for their working career. Mm -hmm. And we give them away for no charge. Mm -hmm. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. And in the United States, a blind person cannot purchase a guide dog from an accredited guide dog school. They are all given for free. Mm -hmm. Yes, you are worth it, though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Six. <laughs> you are worth thousand. every penny. Yeah, $45,000. My yes. goodness. Um, I, I imagine that if any of you want to make a donation to Fidelco, they'd be more than happy to take it. Absolutely. Um, Michael, tell me a little bit about um, some of the experiences that you had with dogs in the state trooper force. Uh, well, I started out my career um, many years ago, but actually my first uh, two dogs that I had were... Fidelco career change dogs. Um, one of them was a uh, patrol dog that was cross-trained to do narcotics, and then the other uh, dog was just a narcotics detection dog. Mm -hmm. um, the dogs were, my first dog, uh, Teddy, uh, being a patrol dog, he was able to um, track missing people and children. He had a uh, very high success rate in that. Uh, that was probably one of the, the most rewarding part of my career, uh, was the fact that when, uh, elderly people that would go missing or children would go missing and, and believe it or not, the, the scent work that was, a, that was put into the dog, um, he just did a phenomenal job. So it's, it's just been a rewarding career and, and it's been 30 years. So um, I, can't, I can't talk enough about it. I've probably trained over 250 mm -hmm. bomb dogs in my career and they've worked all over the world. Do the troopers, um, when they have a dog, are they multi-use so that can they be used for tracking a missing person as well as sniffing out narcotics, as well as are they ever used to um, try to uh, stop a criminal action or to stop someone that you're trying to arrest? Uh, all of those. Uh, we, we have dogs that are, um, that are multi-purpose, meaning they do patrol work. They'll uh, track people, uh, missing, missing children as an example. They'll uh, apprehend suspects if you need them to. They'll recover evidence. Uh, some of the dogs are cross-trained to do narcotic detection, uh, mostly used out on the highways when uh, they're doing uh, motor vehicle stops. They can search a car in a matter of less than a minute, and they can determine whether there's narcotics in there or not. Some of them are also cross-trained to do um, search and rescue work. Uh, and so they're, they're able to have uh, multi-tasks or multi-careers. Then there's the other uh, single purpose dog that just does arson detection or explosive detection or narcotics detection. And those dogs are generally assigned to a detective unit where they, the dogs are used primarily within their special group of expertise. What's the lifespan of a dog's career as a bomb sniffing dog or as a police dog? It, it varies uh, and it really kind of varies based on how much work that they do. Mm -hmm. Uh, but in generally, generally speaking, we're talking about eight to ten years. Around the nine-year mark, we look to um, see that the dog is still physically fit to do the job. We also use the, um, the professional vets to give their annual physical, and they, they're able to give us probably the best guidance as to when the dog should be retired. Um, we want the dogs from around nine, nine to 10 years to retire so that they can have a little bit of a dog's life. Yeah. Um, my, my biggest thing is, is that uh, I have a 10-year-old Labrador now uh, that's been retired for about a year, and I enjoy letting her just take the remote and watch Animal Planet at her leisure. <laughs> <laughs> 
do the um, troopers that are assigned to the dogs often take them home in retirement, or do they go? Uh, can other people volunteer to take a retired dog? Uh, I don't know of any trooper that's not uh, kept his dog in yeah. retirement. Uh, yeah. we, we, you're generally spending more time with your dog than you are with your own family. Uh, so it, yeah. when it's when it's that that golden years for the dogs to retire, that the troopers usually keep them. Yeah. Julie, that doesn't really work for people that have a guide dog, does it? Well, it really depends on their situation. We do have clients that do decide to keep their guide dog mm -hmm. because sometimes it's hard to make a transition to a new guide dog. Mm -hmm. So they might keep that guide dog until uh, the end of that dog's life. Mm -hmm. Or they might have it placed with one of their friends or family members mm -hmm. so that they can still see the dog uh -huh. because that dog did keep them company as well as keep them safe yeah. for a long time. But I would think having two in the family, one who's retired and one who's working, would be confusing for the dogs. Sometimes if it's just a single person household, that does get a little yeah. difficult. Yeah. And that's why every individual is different. Very interesting. Anyone have any questions? Yes, sir. Let's bring the microphone over there. Uh, I had two questions regarding Fidelco. One is what percentage of dogs successfully achieve, uh, you know, uh, being placed through the, the uh, training? And the other one was we're going to become, uh, we're going to raise a dog ourselves, and we have dogs, a German Shepherd of our own. And I'm wondering, is that a good thing or a bad thing? You know, will, will the puppy learn some bad habits, or is it all about socialization? Well, to answer your first question, approximately 60, 55 to 60 percent of the dogs become guide dogs, and approximately 85 to 87 percent of our dogs have some type of working career. So we definitely are raising the dogs to become working dogs. And as far as your household is concerned, we find a dog to match every household, and it is definitely good to have them get used to other dogs. We have some puppy raisers that have cats gerbils, birds, we've seen it all. <laughs> and it really does help because sometimes our clients have pets of their own. So it's definitely a good experience for the puppy to have another dog in the household. Julie was mentioning that uh, once the dog is in the harness, it knows that it's working. Um, Mike, I don't know about um, with your dogs, how do, they in how do you indicate to them that it's time to work? Um, along my hip, I have what we call a, um, a pouch. Uh, whether it's a play reward dog, uh, you'll have this loaded with tennis balls, or if it's a food reward dog, it'll be loaded with food. But generally, when you put this on, that's their triggering mechanism to say, hey, let's go to work. Mm -hmm. um, so in that and the command, uh, the, a dog that's uh, single purpose like Soleil, her command to search is, is the command seek. And once she hears that, she should be on her way to start searching. <laughs> <laughs> She'd like to do that right now. <laughs> How about Gizmo? How does he know when he's working and when he's just being loved up? He um, has a different demeanor when this vest goes on. And really? I think there's people even in the audience here that could vouch to that. He gets very serious minded when this oh. vest goes on. Oh, okay. He says, listen, I'm going to work now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, anybody have any other questions for any of, the, uh, any of these people? If not, then I'm going to invite all of you to do two things. One is, Julie, you did bring books, right? Um, Julie will have books for you right across the hallway in our shop. And the other thing I want to invite you to do is to come outside and to meet our uh, mounted police from Hartford. I do want to tell you a little bit about them because they're relatively, they were a relatively new organization. Um, I thought they went way back to before there were cars and things. Turns out that um, the unit was started in 1985. It was then disbanded in 2000 because of budget cuts. It was revived again by another police chief in 2008, but is now faced again with the possibility of being disbanded again because of budget problems um, in the city of Hartford. So now the four uh, horses and the four officers um, who work with those horses are actually looking for private donations so that they'll be able to feed the horses and keep the, uh, and keep the service going. And um, if you want to go out and meet them, they'll be able to tell you in what ways uh, the horses are really superior to an officer on foot, an officer in a car, how they can really make a big difference um, in the city of Hartford. And it's very, very interesting. Also, um, just a little tidbit, the horses are named after fallen officers, which I think is very, um, very touching. So I, I invite you to go out and meet them. I invite you to get a book. And thank you all of us for being with us. It was wonderful to meet all of you. Appreciate it very much. Thank you.